hi students so today we'll be discussing about renal physiology pathophysiology and medical nutrition therapeutic management for kidney patient basically we'll be discussing about glomerulonephritis nephrotic syndrome acute and chronic renal failure of patient and also we'll be discussing about the etiology clinical and metabolic manifestation and dietary modification uh, like uh, macro elements uh, micronutrients everything will be discussed in detail so get the ball rolling so what is renal disease basically if we introduce uh, 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 do our introductions about the kidney so each kidney is composed of small functional unit called nephron we know kidney kidney is basically two bean shaped organ each kidney is about the size of a like a fist your kidneys filter extra water and waste out of your blood and make you ill kidney disease means your kidneys are damaged and can't filter blood the way they should so you are the greater risk for the kidney disease if you have diabetes or high blood pressure if you experience kidney failure treatments include kidney transplant or dialysis other kidney problems include acute kidney injury kidney cyst kidney stones and kidney infection so basically in this chapter we'll be discussing about the physiology and also the pathophysiology of kidney so this is the anatomy and physiology of a kidney where we can see uh, a kidney basically with lot of nephron so what is nephron basically nephron is the structural and functional unit of the kidney with aging the number of nephron keeps decline and degenerating each nephron consists of glomerula which is a tuft of capillaries invaginated into an epithelial sac bowman capsule from which arises a tubule the different sections of this tubule are the proximal convoluted tubule loop of henle or you can say henle's loop and distal convoluted tubule which in turn open into the collecting duct branches of renal artery give rise to afferent arterioles which divide it to form glomerular capillaries these in turn unite to form the efferent arterioles which supply blood to the renal tubule the important function of the nephron is to maintain the normal composition and volume of the blood basically the nephron filters most constituents except red blood cells and protein from entering the blood major nutrient reabsorption takes place in the proximal tubule the remaining filtrate passes into the loop of henle water is further absorbed in the collecting tubule so students we have to understand what is the functions of nephron because nephron is the only with the functional unit of the kidney so please look at this slide this is the actual anatomy and physiology of a kidney so already i have discussed about nephrons so again it has been seen the different different part of the nephron is the most important part of the each kidney basically is taking blood metabolize nutrient and help pass out waste products from the filter blood renal corpuscles after blood enters as nephron it goes into the renal corpuscle it call a malpighian body the renal corpuscle contains two additional structure glomerulus this is a cluster of capillaries that absorb protein from the blood traveling through the renal corpuscle bowman capsule the remaining fluid called the capsular urine passes to the bowman capsule 
into the renal tubule. Renal tubule, the renal tubules are a series of tubes that begins after the Bowman's capsule and end at the collecting duct. Each tubule has several parts. Proximal convertible tubule, this section absorbs water, sodium, and glucose back into the blood. Loop of Finley, this section further absorbs potassium, chloride, and sodium into the blood. By the time fluid reaches the end of tubule, it's diluted and filled with urea. Urea is byproduct of protein metabolism that's released in urea. What is renal cortex? The renal cortex is the outer part of the kidney. It contains the glomerulus and convolutal tubule. The renal cortex is surrounded on its outer edges by the renal capsule, a layer of fatty tissue. Together, the renal cortex and capsule house protect the inner structure of the kidney. Renal medulla. The renal medulla is the smooth inner tissue of the kidney. It contains the loop of Henle as well as the renal pyramid. What are the renal pyramids? Renal pyramids are the small structure that contains strings of nephrons and tubules. What is the collecting duct? There is a collecting duct at the end of each nephron in the renal medulla. This is where filtered fluid exits the nephron. What is renal pelvis? The renal pelvis is a funnel shaped space in the innermost part of the kidney. It functions as a pathway of the fluid on its way to the bladder. The first part of the renal pelvis contains the calyces. These are small cup shaped spaces that collect fluid before it moves into the bladder. This is also where extra fluid and the waste become urine. There is hilum, there is renal artery, there is renal vein, and also the ureter. We know ureter is a tube of a muscle that pushes urine into the bladder where it collects and exits the body. Now we'll come to the functions of the kidney. So basically the functions of the kidney, there are the three important functions. The three important functions, one is the excretion, one is the endocrine function, and one is the metabolic function. What is excretion? Basically through the urea, uric acid, retinine, acid base, electrolyte like sodium, potassium, chloride, and also water. So these are the basically the excretion part. What are the endocrine functions basically? The endocrine function synthesis of the active vitamin D3, erythropoietin for the RBC formation, renin, and angiotensin for the blood pressure regulation. Uh, students, you have to understand there is a very good relationship between the blood pressure and the renal function. That's why renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system or mechanism is there. That will come later on. So that, that's why it's very important for the blood pressure regulation and the kidney function. So this is the endocrine function. And what are the metabolic function? Metabolic functions are nitrogen metabolism and the gluconeogenesis, especially during starvation. We all know about the protein sparing action, gluconeogenesis, and also the nitrogen metabolism. So this is a very important part where, where, where kidney is doing functioning this all. So glucose, amino acid, bicarbonate, sodium, water, phosphate, chloride, magnesium, potassium, and all are basically the reabsorbed products. Okay. So maintenance pH is also their function. The function are basically the osmolality regulation. Osmolality is a measure of the body's electrolyte water balance or the ratio between the fluid and the minerals in the body. Dehydration is the primary cause of the electrolyte imbalance. If osmolality rises in the blood plasma, the hypothalamus in the brain responds by passing a message to the pituitary gland, this in turn releasing the ADH, I mean anti-diuretic hormone. In response to ADH, the kidney makes a number of changes, including increasing urine concentration, increasing water reabsorption, reopening portions of the collecting duct that water cannot normally enter, allowing water back into the body, retaining urea in the medulla of the kidney rather than excreting it as it's causing the 
water. That's why there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, the adverse events, a lot of symptoms like edema, uh, the, the ascites, uh, there are a lot of, lot of symptoms will happen during this kind of condition. That's why fluid restrictions is one of our major parts that will come later on during that, that, that is, uh, I think, the next. And also the blood pressure, what I'm saying, the blood pressure is also one of the causes. The kidneys regulate blood pressure when necessary, but they're responsible for the slower adjustment. So adjust long-term pressure in the arteries by causing changes in the fluid outside of the cells. The medical term of this fluid is the extracellular fluid. These fluid changes occur after the release of a vasoconstrictor called angiotensin II. Vasoconstrictors are hormones that cause blood vessels to narrow. Blood vessels to narrow is called the vasoconstriction. One is dilate, it's called the vasodilation. They work with other functions to increase the kidney's absorption of sodium chloride or salt. This effectively increases the size of the extracellular fluid compartment and raises blood pressure. Anything that alters blood pressure can damage the kidneys over time, including excessive alcohol consumption, smoking, and obesity. Secretions of active compounds, the kidneys release a number of important compounds, including erythropoietin, the controls erythropoiesis of the production of red blood cells. Renin, these cells manage the expansion of arteries and the volume of blood plasma, lymph, and intercessional fluid, and also calcitriol. This is hormonally active metabolite of vitamin D. It increases both the amount of calcium that is intestine can absorb and the reabsorption of the phosphate in the kidney. That's why all the you know nutrients are important, like sodium, potassium, phosphorus, calcium. Yeah, all things are very important. Now, this is the pathophysiology of renal disease. So, what would be the pathophysiology of the renal disease? That is very important because pathophysiology is one of a cause and one of a reason where we can understand that the, uh, you know, the, the kidney problem and kidney disease. You can see there are a lot of roots. There are a lot of roots about the pathophysiology, pathophysiological roots. Okay. One is the root of the, you know, clinical manifestation during the blood pressure, that is one of our roots. Another root, you know, there is also the glomerular filtration rate, rate, that is also a root. Another root is called the infection. There are a lot of infection. You know, if we come to the etiology, there may be some, you know, uh, the, the bacterial uh, infection. You know, uh, there are, uh, you know, this kind of problem it happens also in the three to 10 years of old, young adults also. Okay, there are some septicocal infection also. There are um, a systemic uh, lupus erythromoietis, SLE is there, cancers is there. There's a lot of other problems that is the etiology. But if we talk about the pathophysiology, there we can see, number one, there's the antibody response to the bacteria, viruses, chemicals, antibiotics, is called the septicocal infection. From there, excess antigen antibody complex, AAC in circulation. From there, antigen antibody complex trapped in glomeruli. From there, antigen antibody complex binds components of complement. From there, activated complement provides chemical factors that attract leukocytes. From there, the lysosomal enzymes of leukocytes causes injury to the glomeruli. From there, lumps of antigen antibody complex deposit between the epithelial cell of the nephron capsule and the basement membrane of the glomeruli. From there, lesions develop, fibrinogen leaks into Bowman's capsule. From there, scar tissue is formed and obstructs the circulation to the glomeruli. From there, fatty degeneration, necrosis, and destruction. Necrosis means death. Necrosis and destruction of nephron. From there, reduction in the number of functioning nephron. From there, nephritis, and from there also kidney failure. So this is very important. And in this picture, you can clearly see this GFR, glomerular filtration rate is there. Number one, one stage one means 90. Okay, 90 and below 90. Stage two means 60 to 90. Stage three means 45 to 60. Stage three A. And stage three B means 30 to 44. Stage four means 15 to 29. Stage five means end stage renal disease, ESRD, that is below 50. So more GFR, 
means good. Less GFR below 15 is typically end stage viral disease. Okay, so this is all about the pathophysiology, where you know the leakage of glomerulus, leakage of any kind of infection in nephrons due to this, and also there are some drug nutrient interaction created there because you, we know there are certain drugs okay like uh, angio uh, 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 you know tensin converting enzyme mineralocorticoids uh, 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 antagonist receptor, receptor antagonist so these are the drugs where can side effects can also occur and also there are other drugs like you know any kind of analgesic like non steroid anti inflammatory drug that is also how so there are a lot of you know lot of etiological chatting, lot of various of causes that can do the kidney problem, chronic kidney. So this is an ideal picture for you. So what is chronic kidney disease? Chronic kidney disease is a long-standing progressive deterioration of renal function. Symptoms develop slowly. And advanced stages include anorexia, nausea, vomiting, stomatitis, cramps, water retention, undernutrition, peripheral neuropathies, this all of this. So basically, from a quote of National Health of Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANE 2018, the prevalence of CKD, stages 1 through 5, in the US adult generation population is estimated at 14.8%. What is the etiology? Chronic kidney disease may result from any cause of renal dysfunction of sufficient magnitude. Okay, the most common cause in the US in order to prevalence are the diabetic nephropathy. You know, if the uncontrolled diabetes can cause to the CKD, we call the diabetes comorbidity. Okay, hypertensive nephrosclerosis, various primary and secondary glomerular uh, nephritis, nephrotic syndrome, metabolic syndrome, which is hypertension and type 2 diabetes are present is a large and growing cause of the there are a lot of causes of the renal damage. In case of pathophysiology, where I've discussed also, is the initial described as a diminished renal reserve or renal insufficiency, which may progress to renal failure. It's called the ESRD. Initially, as renal tissue losses function, there are a few noticeable abnormalities because the remaining tissue increases its performance, renal functional adaptation. Decreased renal function interferes with the kidney's ability to maintain fluid and electrolyte homeostasis. What I've told you before also, is 15 ml per mean per 1.7 meter square. This is the GFR rate. So in case of GFR rate, we say this is the end stage renal. What are the symptoms of the renal failure? What, what are the symptoms? What you can see the renal failure? Symptoms are Hematuria, you know, presence of RBC in the urine, proteinuria, albuminuria, this kind of symptoms also happen. Renal blood flow and the glomerular filtration rate are reduced as much 50% or more at the damaged glomerular capillaries allow plasma protein in the blood cells to pass through into the Bowman's capsule. Blood pressure raises malaise, headache, swelling of face, persistent nausea, confusion, shortness of breath. So we have discussed a lot of certain subjects during our cardiovascular congenital heart disease slides. So these slides also certain subjects is very important. Mild acidosis. Okay, so uh, this is also important. And in case of nephrotic syndrome, there are the symptoms like in edema, hmm? proteinuria also. There's the symptoms. Okay, and due to the serum protein losses, tissue proteins broken down, resulting in the general malnutrition. So these are. Several diseases, and also there, I, I, I told you several times that they are edema, edema, and edema. Swelling of your legs, ankles, feet, from retention of fluids caused by the failure of the kidney to eliminate water. So, this is the edema, is the one kind of you know, symptom of kidney failure. So, what are the early signs of the kidney failure? Symptoms of the early stage kidney disease may be difficult to pinpoint. They are often Subtle and hard to identify. If you experience early signs of kidney disease, decreased urine output, fluid retention that leads to swelling in limbs, and shortness of this is very important. Decreased urine output. There is a basically it may be oliguria, maybe anuria, fluid retention that leads to swelling in limbs, shortness of 
causes of kidney failure i told before also kidney failure can be the result of several condition of course people who are most at risk usually have one or more of the following causes that i told also before heart attack heart disease heart failure scarring of the liver or liver failure fever burn allergic reaction sepsis high blood pressure anti inflammatory medication nsaidi all are like pain killer huh? there are a lot of tendency to people have pain killer very rapidly and for a long term the so long term effect will be very adverse even for the kidney failure this is one of the causes so this is one of the causes for the kidney failure other causes is urine elimination problem when body can't eliminate urine toxins build up and overload the kidneys some cancers can block also the urine passageway prostate most common type in men some people have now you know prostate megaly and this is a very common colon cervical bladder other conditions can interfere urination and possibly to kidney failure like kidney stone you know the renal calculi enlarged prostate blood clots within your urinary tract damage to your nerves and control your bladder so these are the other causes other clinical causes that also can lead to chronic renal failure or kidney disease now we'll come to the test what are the tests we'll be discussing about the clinical biochemistry uh, blood test also and also the imaging so let's come to the blood test first one is number one is the urea and the creatinine so these are the basically diagnostic tests we're talking about so urea creatinine basically the tend to increase the blood due to the inadequate excretion in the impaired kidney function basically it uh, happens due to the you know uh, it's a longer term may marker of renal function it mainly arises from the muscle to so level may be elevated after consumption of meat so meat is uh, so you uh, have to understand meat is a very you know uh, creatinine rich food and also have a good amount of methionine and sulfur so i also discussed about the gfr glomerular filtration rate so it's measured by the creatinine clearance test and measure of the efficiency with the kidneys remove a substance from the blood normal creatinine clearance is adults is about 1255 ml per minute which can be reduced to 30 ml per minute or less when kidneys fail so gfr is previously assessed by taking a 24 hour urine sample but it's now estimated egfr estimated glomerular filtration rate from one or two equation that that basically the cockroft gall equation uses serum creatinine weight is then calculated is there also with the mdrd formula takes in the account hx creatinine and ethnicity to determine the egfr free online calculators are available for the both equation but health professionals must check with the local pathology laboratory to find out which they should use because also the egfr can do by the pathology but some people have the calculator they have calculated the glomerular filtration rate urine protein is very important a few different tests may be used to screen for the protein in the urine urine albumin and albumin creatinine ratio which is used to call acr this detects small amounts of albumin in the urine the american diabetes association recommend acr as the preferred test for screening for albumin in the urine microalbuminuria urine analysis this is a routine test that can detect protein in the urine as well as red blood cells and white blood cells where i told, told you also hematuria is a not normally found in the urine and if present may indicate the kidney disease urine total protein or urine protein to creatinine ratio up or by cr detects not just albumin but all types of proteins that may be present in the urine how the tests are performed kidney function test usually require a 24 hour urine sample and the blood test now we'll come to relation because in case of renal function test i i have already discussed but in also electrolyte that's simultaneously important for the with the renal function test. what are electrolyte panel electrolytes are electrically charged minerals that help control the amount of fluid and the balance of acids and bases in our body they help control muscle and nerve activity heart rhythm and other important function electrolyte panel there is sodium sodium is very important is electrolyte potassium is there chloride is there bicarbonate is there the level increase and decrease depending of the kidney disorder in sodium we can say the amount of the fluid in the body nerves muscles work properly chloride helps control the amount of the fluid in the body helps maintain healthy blood volume and the blood pressure potassium helps heart muscles work properly 
bicarbonate maintain the acid and base salt it also plays an important role in moving carbon dioxide to the blood stream abnormal levels of these electrolytes can be sign of a serious health problem like kidney disease high blood pressure and also a life threatening irregularity in hospital which called the arrhythmia is also uh, in, uh, in abnormal uh, electrolyte level can you know okay now we're talking about the kidney imaging test so what are the imaging tests this is not the blood test this is basically the imaging test ultrasound is one of the imaging tests what is the ultrasound the test uses sound wave to get a picture of the kidney it may be used to look of abnormalities in size or position of the kidneys or for obstruction such as stones or tumors during your practical examination or internship you can see the you know the report of the usg ultrasonography report where can they defend the diameter the measurement the kidney and the impression okay by a by a radiologist ct scan this imaging technique uses x rays to picture in the kidneys it may also be used to look of structural abnormality and the presence of obstruction this test may require the use of the intravenous contrast dye which can be concern of for those kidney now we'll talk about our special paper part that is the medical nutrition therapy we'll discuss about okay so before starting this medical nutrition therapy i will just briefly uh, want to discuss about the common renal diseases so what are the common renal diseases acute and chronic nephritis nephrotic syndrome acute renal failure renal transplantation renal calculi and also the dialysis so in this uh, slide we will we'll be not discussing about the dialysis renal transplantation and renal calculi that will be discussed in another slide in this slide talking about the normal kidney disease with medications and the diet so in the dietetics part we'll come to the dietetics part we can see that the general principles or guideline we have to follow so what are the guidelines you have to follow that the reduce the excretory work of the kidneys while maintaining as a near normal fluid acid base electrolyte balance maintain satisfactory nutritional status prevent progression of renal damage and development of the uremia accumulation of the adrenal base product in the blood to meet the three basic objectives protein electrolyte especially sodium and potassium and the fluid but we will be discussing about each and every nutrient that is important for because in nutrients is a very uh, major role in the cases for the management of the medical nutrition therapy for the renal disease so for, so uh, what are the first thing the first thing was that energy that calorie so calorie is basically in, in uh, for children is 80 kilocalorie per kg body weight and and 10% for the infection suggested sufficient calories is given without increasing the protein intake by means of sugar honey glucose sagu fats and oils and the starchy food by being carbohydrates liberally protein catabolism and starvation ketosis are reduced basically you may also need to adjust how many calories how many calories you eat based on your weight goal because you know weight is very important because bmi in this case is very important some people will need to limit the calories they eat others may need to have some more calories so your doctor dietitians can help you to figure out how many calories you should have each day work with your dietitians and make a meal plan definitely the dietitian should let you know the you know calorie intake on daily basis because it's not a printed kind of diet chart it should be case specific it should be gender specific work specific and also their bmi specific. so that is very important when when we're talking about the calorie now we'll come to the protein so protein is a major role you know in in, in if the blood urine nitrogen is elevated and oligiuria is present then dietary protein must be restricted usually the diet contain 0.5 g of protein per kg ideal body weight for older children and 1 to co2 1.5 g per kg per day for the younger children in intake proteins is reduced to a minimum by excluding the protein rich protein rich food so in that cases in that cases in the dietary ma management we will always try to maintain a ideal 
good protein and also proper consumption of protein is tricky for the chronic kidney disease because protein is a essential part it's not that we always try to restrict as much as we can protein no their negative nitrogen balance catabolism will occur so protein is essential for the tissue maintenance and the other bodily roles so it is important to eat the recommended amount for the specific stage of disease diet should be on the high biological value of protein to reduce into load nitrogen load a mixture of essential amino acid is recommended so in that cases in hospital you get, get a chart and get a you know a, a, a guideline that low protein one is a 40 g per idol kg body weight definitely biochemistry clinical report suggested low protein 2 20 g per idol kg body weight that should be accordingly you can make a diet plan for the ckd patient so protein is a major role and very important role for managing this thing now talking about the carbohydrate so if, if we talk about the carbohydrate basically a minimum of 100 g per day is essential to minimize tissue protein breakdown it's not like low carb no carb that's a fancy diet carbohydrate are the easiest kind of energy for your body to use so healthy source of carbohydrate include fruits and vegetables and in this was like sugar honey hard candies aerated drinks sugary drinks no should be 30 300 to 400 g per day to avoid endogenous protein catabolism gluconeogenesis and subsequently anemia we shouldn't allow gluconeogenesis you know what is gluconeogenesis that apart from you know any other sources when the amino acid from the protein can break down to glucose is called the gluconeogenesis high intake due to its protein sparing action so we shouldn't allow protein sparing action that's why high intake is important and we have to follow the rule the optimum protein rule according to you have to make a diet plan for the patient to get on ckd right next we'll talk about the fat so fat is also very essential because you know in cases of fat your energy and health due to some vitamins in your food but too much fat can lead to weight gain and heart disease try to limit fat in your meal plan so choose the healthy fat i always told about the you know monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat okay that is very healthy but shouldn't go for the saturated fat okay if you talk about the good fat unsaturated fat that is olive oil peanut oil corn oil and unsaturated fat can help reduce cholesterol if you need if you need to gain weight try to eat more unsaturated fat if you need to lose weight limit the unsaturated fat also but saturated fat you shouldn't do butter ghee lard shortening meat okay creams all the in you know kind of a trans fat like cookies margarine these things should be limited from your diet so this kind of fat should be limited from your diet and also limit to 30% energy from the fat less than 300 mg of cholesterol especially if the patient has the hyperlipoproteinemia and also hypercholesteremia and dyslipidemia so limit this in your meal plan choose healthy unsaturated fat instead trimming the fat from the meat and removing the skin basically we can try to incorporate much more of lean lean meat rather than organ meat okay we shouldn't go for organ meat only always avoid trans fat this kind of fat makes your bad cholesterol ldl low density lipoprotein cholesterol higher and your good cholesterol lower when this happens you are more likely to get heart disease which can cause the kidney damage now we'll talk about the sodium we already covered about the macronutrients we're talking about the micronutrients sodium is salt basically is a, min a mineral found in almost all food too much sodium can make you thirsty which can lead to swelling and raise your blood pressure this can damage your kidneys more and make your heart work harder so sodium loss to urine is measured and replaced so dialysis hyponatremia occurred due to water retention water restriction then salt administration is indicated therefore sodium restriction is also judged based on sodium loss in the urine so do not add salt choose fresh or frozen vegetables instead of canned and preserved vegetables If you do use canned vegetables, drain and rinse them to remove excess salt before cooking or eating them. 
500 mg to uh, to uh, gram per day like 2000 mg additionally sodium in case of weight loss and decreasing urine volume and restriction of sodium in case of edema and hypertension high blood pressure monitor and diuretic because there are a lot of diuretics we will be discussing about the diuretics in that cases we always monitor we always discuss with your doctor uh, regarding which diuretics we diet and medications going on but you should always discuss about the medicine with your doctor but diet part always you talk to a dietitian now talk about the potassium potassium is a mineral found is almost all food your body needs some potassium to make your muscles work but too much potassium can be dangerous when your kidneys are not working well your potassium level may be too high or too low having too much or too little potassium can cause muscle cramps problems with the way your heart beats and muscle weakness if hyperkalemia hyperkalemia means when the potassium level elevates okay then we restrict the 1000 to 2000 mg 25 to 50 m eq on improvement increase to 60 to 70 mg intake must be kept at 1500 mg per day that is 3 mg per day and in case of significant losses potassium supplement should be given potassium supplement is a lot of medications is there and also there are some pot chlor medication is there also and their medication with the fruit juices sometimes uh, doctors can suggest calcium and phosphorus calcium supplementations 1 to 2 g per day and phosphate to be restricted 800 to 1200 mg per day phosphorus is a mineral found in almost all food it works with calcium and vitamin d to keep your bones healthy healthy kidneys keep the right amount of phosphorus in your body when your kidneys are not working well phosphorus can build up in your blood too much phosphorus in your blood can lead to weak bones that break easily so many people with kidney disease to limit the phosphorus intake so in case of dietary management in many patient we are always try to you know decrease the dietary phosphorus level always there is a decrease the phosphorus because phosphorus is a mineral that found in lot of food now we are talking about the fluid is a very major part fluid part is a very major part because total fluid intake is a very important part where you can see the any kind of liquid item the patient is consuming is considered as total fluid total fluid intake it's not like the water but any kind of fluid he or she is consuming is considered as a fluid so you need to water to live but when you have kidney disease you may not need as much this is because damaged kidneys do not get rid of extra fluid as well as they should too much fluid in your body can be dangerous it can cause high blood pressure swelling and heart failure extra fluid can also build up around your lungs and make it hard to breathe so if it uh, you know fluid retention in your lungs like pulmonary edema proliferation can occur so it will be life threatening if we do not limit fluid measure your fluid and drink some small cups to help you keep track sometimes you can measure with some calibrated bottle or any kind of shaker limit sodium to help cut down on that. because if you take lot of sodium water retention will occur at times you may still feel thirsty to help quench in your thirst you might try to chew gum in diabetic also sugar free chewing gum rinse your mouth suck on a piece of ice means or hard candy so this is a way intake is dependent on urine output and water balance this is very important you have to monitor but to monitor the urine output and water balance in case of in hospital when you go for the internship you can see there chart is there like urine output and water balance you have to talk to the sister and discuss about the fluid level if reduce gfr and oliguria restrict to amount equal to urine volume plus 500 ml so now we will talking about the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system this is very it's called the ras pathway and the ras system how it's occur from the liver it secretes angiotensinogen from the angiotensinogen it will comes to you know uh, with the help of renin renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 is called angiotensin 1 from angiotensin 1 angi angiotensin converting enzyme ace with the help of ace ace comes from lungs 
will have to angiotensin 2 from the angiotensin 2 it will goes to the angina stimulates aldosterone secretion in the adrenal gland kidney angiotensin stimulates sodium and the fluid retention in the kidneys angiotensin stimulates muscle hypertrophy and fibrosis in the heart angiotensin stimulates sympathetic outflow in the brain angiotensin stimulates vasoconstriction in blood vessel vasoconstriction mean constricted blood vasoconstricted will very you know you know if blood pressure rises up that's why there are medications there are medications like angiotensin angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor in that case as you can see their angiotensin converting inhibitor block the ac that's why angiotensin will do will not occur so vasoconstriction will not occur again another medicine is called angiotensin 2 receptor blocker that is also will not form this disease distinction to reduce the vasoconstriction so these all of the basically the blood pressure lowering medication antihypertensive drug ace inhibitor angiotensin 2 receptor blocker all are the blood pressure lowering medication in case of ace inhibitors the example are ramipril enalapril captopril in case of angiotensin 2 receptor blocker we can say the sartan all the sartan like elmisartan valsartan huh, um, all are the sartan group huh, are the examples of the angiotensin 2 receptor blocker so these are major functions of the kidneys and the heart okay so we have to understand the ras pathway is very important to understand the arterial pressure in the kidney decrease sodium in the blood increase sympathetic tone and sodium and fluid retention. So these all part are depends on the this RAS system or RAS part. So now we'll come to the drug neutron interaction. We're talking about basically the hypertensive drug and also the kidney drug. So in AC inhibitor drugs like enalapril, captopril, so AC inhibitors are drugs that widen the blood vessels to improve your blood flow if you are taking this drug. Okay. Definitely, because AC inhibitors, ACE helps to this conversion and do the vasoconstriction. But if they inhibit the, uh, the system, I'm just going back to the previous slide. If they inhibit the system to angiotensin converting enzyme ACE2 angiotensin receptor block receptor, there is no chance of the vasoconstriction. So the dilations will occur. So it will be helpful. So these drugs will be there, like enalapril, captopril, salt substitute, but they have potassium. And AC inhibitors make your body retain potassium. So over the counter, no steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs like acetaminophen, aspirin, ibuprofen, uh, um, naproxen. These may cause your body to retain sodium and water and make AC inhibitors not work as well. So in case of AC inhibitors is working, we always try to, you know, see the blood report, the potassium report, and the sodium report. That is very important. That's why screening is very important you also the mc book has written the screening is there screening is very important. okay so we are this is the way you have to check the doctor's prescription which are the drugs this way which are the drugs this patient is taking okay because there are a lot of foam it's not like only kidney disease alone it may be hypertension type 2 diabetes many drugs uncontrolled diabetes and sickness. so you have to see all the things i monitor, monitor all the things okay Apart from that, there is a uh, drug is called the mineralocorticoid, uh, the corticosteroid uh, antagonist receptors, uh, you know, spinal axon, naldactron, that is also important. So in that case, we also have to restrict the dietary potassium uh, at as much as we can the potassium. Okay, potassium restriction should be. Now we're talking about the diuretic. That is basically the water pill. Very simple, it's called the water tablets on the water pill because they can cause you to pass more urine the urine. They work on the kidneys by increasing the amount of salt and water that comes out through the urine. Diuretics often prescribed for the heart failure patient and sometimes for the patient with the high blood pressure. You can see there are some combination drugs is there. Like tell me certain, tell me certain with the CP. Like total thylogue would be done. Furosemide, the diuretic. Okay. There are a lot of things are there. So this is the way we have to understand which drug is going because there are a lot of nowadays there are 
combination of drugs are there. Okay, like with TT, something with D, you have to understand. Among patients taking digoxin, lanoxin, low levels of potassium caused by the concurrent digoxin and diuretic. Okay, thiazide group of drugs, but thiazide, okay, and the loop diuretic may cause the weakness, cramps, and the irregular heartbeat. In case of lithium, like lithobit, lithonate, lithotab, given concurrently with diuretics, thiazide, and the loop diuretics may induce lithium toxicity due to the decreased renal elimination of lithium. Lithium levels should be monitored to ensure safety. Potassium sparing diuretic is given with the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor on non steroidal anti inflammatory drug NACDIs. For example, like indomethacin, indocon have been associated with the severely elevated levels of the potassium, like hypertension. Severe rate of the like radicardial, it is important to monitor potassium blood levels and to have the electrocardiogram should be performed. Diuretics are often prescribed with other medications for the high blood pressure and the heart disease. These may increase the effects of this medication. Potentiality causes electrolyte abnormalities such as reduced levels of the potassium. Not only diuretics, AC inhibitors and the ARBs, there are also the modern drug like, like ARNI, and you can see uh, the, the, you know, the receptor of nephrolyzing inhibitor that basically fit for the heart failure patient. This is also the adverse effect, side effect, uh, side effect basically, so it's not the adverse event, is the hyper uh, hyper So you have to check the potential. So electrolyte and the renal function test simultaneously, we have we have to monitor. That is very important. We have to monitor. So this is all about the nutrition management part. Uh, that is, uh, we have to uh, take care of it also. Not only uh, uh, these things, because we are talking about a lot of restriction, but if, if it is needed, then sometimes uh, the dietitian can add the multivitamin supplement, especially vitamin D in cases, because there are, you know, if, if we restrict a lot of things, so maybe they are, uh, you know, problems and inadequacy of vitamin D we can offer. So we have to give some vitamin uh, D3 supplementation. So basically multivitamin can also recommend it. So student, this is all about the renal physiology, pathophysiology and the dietary management. Uh, we'll be discussing about renal transplantation, kidney transplant and uh, dialysis others. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any question, please feel free to ask. Thank you.